free webinars. So please note that no federal funds are used for any of the three webinars in the 20, TLPI's 25th anniversary series. Um, the theme for the 25th anniversary is celebrating the journey, honoring our relatives, and building a vision for the future. Uh, this webinar focuses on the first part of the theme, which is celebrating the journey. Today, we will be celebrating the journeys involved in the VAWA 2013 reauthorization and the implementation uh, of its landmark special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction provision, uh, along with current VAWA reauthorization efforts uh, to strengthen this, the initial, this initial limited restoration of tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians. Um, and now I'm pleased to introduce uh, Mary Catherine Nagel um, and the distinguished panel who are joining us today. Uh, our facilitator, Mary Catherine Nagel, is an attorney, a playwright, and a partner at Pipes, uh, Pipestem and Nagel, a firm dedicated to the preservation and restoration of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction. Today, we'll dis be discussing one of Mary Catherine's plays, The Sliver of a Full Moon, which documents the legal and jurisdictional challenges uh, caused by the 1978 Supreme Court Oliphant decision and the journey involved in the bipartisan legislative battle uh, for the tribal jurisdiction provisions in VAWA 2013. Sliver of a Full Moon is about the power of sharing our own stories. Uh, in the words of survivor Lisa Bruner, uh, the partial restoration of tribal jurisdiction in VAWA 2013 is just a sliver of the full moon we need to ensure that all of our women are safe. Until all of our tribe's jurisdiction is fully restored, no one is safe. Uh, the panel today includes the following. Um, Glenn Gobin, who serves as the vice chair of the Tulalip tribes, one of the first tribes to implement special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction. Uh, Michelle Demerit, who serves as the Law and Policy Director of the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, and Carrie Colfer, who serves as the Senior Native Affairs Advisor for the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to Mary Catherine. Thank you so much, uh, Jerry and, and Heather and Marlon and everyone else for for having me here today to celebrate this incredible anniversary for TLPI. It's an honor to be with you all. And I will just note that Billy Jo Rich was also supposed to be with us today. She is a citizen of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, a survivor and advocate. Um, her voice was one of the many powerful voices in 2013 that she spoke out and told her story and shared her story. And her story among many others compelled Congress to restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over domestic violence crimes committed by non-Indians. So um, it, she unfortunately has some family issues to tend to back at home, but otherwise would be here with us. And so just wanted to acknowledge Billy Joe as well, since she's she's not here at this moment, but uh, really just appreciate everyone joining today and having this conversation. I'm so excited about the, the panelists that we have here. I think uh, we have some of the top, top VAWA experts across the country. And so what we are going to be doing is a little bit of a hybrid um, we are going to be showing a couple clips from the play Sliver of Full Moon, and then I'll be asking some follow-up questions to our panelists based on those clips that sort of tie into different themes and issues that are discussed in the play. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free, um, as was mentioned before, to drop them into the q and I'm hoping that when we finish, we're going to get to a place where um, we can take those questions. And so just to be clear, I wrote Sliver of, of a Full Moon. Um, I actually started writing it before VAWA was passed in 2013. Initially, the goal was to have a play that would that would be advocacy, that would help us advocate for that passage of VAWA. And as I was doing interviews of survivors like Billy Joe and Lisa Bruner and Missy Brady and Nettie Warbelo and Diane Millich, um, all of a sudden VAWA passed. And so it became a play uh, that we sort of were starting to celebrate this amazing historic victory in 2013. And, uh, but we quickly realized that although it was a huge victory, uh, our sisters and our brothers and our relatives in Alaska were left out. 
And so since then too, this play has highlighted that issue. And as we'll, we will discuss during today's call, there were many, although Volvo 2013 was a huge victory and it's still something to celebrate, uh, many gaps remain. And that's why everyone who's on this call today, including Vice Chairman Glenn Govan, um, Michelle Dimmer and Carrie Colfer are all working super hard uh, and getting this next VAWA passed. And, and we will be talking about that as well. And so just to get us uh, started, um, Marlon, if we could play the first clip, um, and this will be about, just so everyone knows, it's about a five minute clip. And then after that, I'm gonna come back and ask some direct questions of our panelists. So thank you so much. Dini o galala di, dini o galala di, dini o galala di. Juno du iwane hesti. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I remember what I was thinking. And I will never, forget. never forget. I was on the floor of the house. At my home in Fairfax. On my reservation. In Cherokee. In Alaska. Alaska. Watching CNN. C-SPAN. Facebook. Watching the boat. Working for boats. I couldn't breathe. I was so nervous. All I could do is pray. What's the boat? 30. We got 30? We need 218. We need your vote. You got my vote. 31. Thank you. 62. 62. My whole life. I dreamed of this. 85. I prayed for this. 114. You got my vote, Tom. Thank you. 115. Everything depends on this. What if we lose? We can't lose. Not an option. 201. 201? Oh my God. I just prayed to creator 215 holy smoke 216 we got this 217 is this for real 218 we did, we it. did it 218 218 they're still coming more votes 235 246 250 285 285 286 votes. I couldn't believe it. It didn't feel real. I had to call Jax. Harry texted me. I just started texting. I started crying. I could hardly see who I was texting. I was crying so hard. I had to scream. I scared my neighbors. I did a victory dance. I prayed for my sisters. It just seemed unreal. It felt like, like a dream. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was a miracle. What about Alaska? Next time. I promise. Why were we left out? Everyone says. There's no Indian country in Alaska. Alaska's different. Why are we different? When Baba passed, I was watching TV and I started to cry. The rates of violence against Native women in Alaska are higher than anywhere else in the United States. And yet somehow we're always forgotten. But we're here. We're still here. We've always been here. From the time of the glaciers until now. We were here before the United States. We were here before the Russians. We were here when they came. Our men gave them fur. And in exchange, they gave us alcohol. And then they took our women. This one. Just one night. Hmm? <laughs> I'll bring her back, yes? Yeah? <laughs> we had no choice. You had Columbus. We had the Russians. Tell me, how is that that different? This, this is, is my, my story. story. This is my story. 
This is my story. The story of my sister. Of my daughter. The story of my mother. And her mother. And her mother's mother. Grandmother. My granddaughter. This is the story. Of my life. Of my past. Of my people. This, this is, is my, my story. story. At first, it was hard to share it. I had to keep it a secret. I was too ashamed. Too embarrassed. Too afraid. Scared. Forgotten. I was silenced. I thought I'd be judged. For something I never did. But then we came together. We stopped. We stopped silence. Silence. If I wasn't native, my story would be different. If I didn't live on my reservation, my story would be different. If I wasn't a citizen of a sovereign Indian nation, my story would be different. I live in Alaska. When it comes to justice, that shouldn't make my story different. This, this is my, my story. story. And I'm here to share it. One sunny afternoon in May, I was returning my daughters to their father per our agreement. Thank you so much, Marlon. And uh, every time I watch that, I'm just amazed at all the incredible people who have been a part of this play and this storytelling. But um, as you will see, that is uh, from when the American Bar Association hosted Silver Full Moon uh, about a year ago. And uh, in, in that little excerpt, what you saw, um, first of all, Billy Joe was there. So she's still with us today, even though she can't be on the panel. Actually, a, a Cherokee actress, Candace Bird, was playing Nettie Warbelow. Um, and Nettie's track in Sliver of Full Moon follows various interviews I did with uh, women from all different tribal communities and tribal nations in Alaska. And so she's a bit of an am amalgamation character in that she combines several different stories into one. And the character of Tammy is based off of Tammy Giroux and is also a bit of a, um, a combination of different stories that come from Alaska. But um, I'd like to send the first question to Michelle Demert here today and specifically to ask Michelle, um, you know, in VAWA 2013, what we just saw discussion of, right, 228 of the 229 Alaska tribes were left out because of the complicated legal status and history in Alaska. How has that impacted public safety for Native women and children in Alaska? Thank you, Mary Catherine, for the question and uh, TLPI for asking me to be part of this celebration. I have to say that um, Sliver of the Full Moon still catches me off guard. Um, it's such a visceral reaction. And I found myself um, having goosebumps listening to the passage and then having such um, sadness hearing about Alaska being um, left out essentially. So anyway, about your question, the state of Alaska like the federal government has failed in providing for public safety in our Alaska Native villages. Um, the Tribal Law and Order Commission report stated that about 40% of our communities lack any sort of law enforcement. We lack the basic infrastructure that other states take for granted. For example, we do not have a centralized 911 system. When we need help, we need to figure out if we need a medic or a police officer, and then we actually dial a seven digit number, not 911. And we have to have that. Um, and it, it's different for medics and law enforcement. So, you know, the rest of the country, I think, has a really hard time comprehending just how little resources we actually have in rural Alaska. And you heard that in your, um, in the play, that we're different. And people just, I think their, their eyes glaze over when they think about what the differences are. As I mentioned, most of the Alaska Native villages are located in remote areas that are often inaccessible by road and have no local law enforcement presence, meaning that there is a hub community that provides law, um, law enforcement. And sometimes that hub community can have upwards of seven communities that they have to provide law enforcement services for. Um, as I mentioned, the Tribal Law and Order Commission found that Alaska Department of Public Safety officers have primary responsibility for rural Alaska, about 1.4 field officers per million acres. So how do you cover that? 
how do you provide law enforcement in such a vast area? I mean, and but there are solutions. Um, we need the justice that VAWA can provide based on our population proportion of the overall state. We are overrepresented in the domestic violence by 250%, yet we only comp comprise 19% of the population. We have to be included in the protections of a VAWA bill. It is not hyperbole that it is a matter of life and death. Our women were hopeful by VAWA 2013, and I was almost thinking um, it was a little bit like gaslighting, um, you know, to use a, a common colloquialism, um, but, you know, that there were these assurances that VAWA was going to provide us with some protections, but we really saw nothing change in our legal system. We were seeing lack of investigations, less, lack of prosecutions, and sadly, um, we're back to underreporting crimes because why report crimes if nothing is going to happen other than endanger you more from the perpetrator? So thank you for the question. Well, it's, it's so important, Michelle, and you have been an incredible advocate, um, specifically for, you know, everyone in Alaska, your, your nation, all the other tribes in Alaska, but also for all women and everyone in Indian country and fighting for VAWA reauthorization right now. And I just think it's important that we, um, that we all, even though none of us uh, who aren't from Alaska will ever fully understand the scope of the issues that, that we educate ourselves and that we make an effort to try to understand because it is so critical and, and there are so many legal fixes that are necessary and, and that are, um, that, that should just be a no brainer, right? Um, <laughs> everyone has a right to be safe in his or her home or their home and uh, just really, really appreciate your advocacy. And, and joining us today, because I know you're insanely busy. Um, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> so uh, even just a little bit of your time is, is uh, incredible. So I want to move on to the next question, and that will be for our Vice Chairman Glenn Gobin from the Tulalip Tribes. And the Tulalip Tribes were one of the very first to implement VAWA's restored tribal criminal jurisdiction. And since implementing the restored criminal jurisdiction in 2013, Vice Chairman Gobin, how has public safety on your reservation increased? How has the restored tribal criminal jurisdiction from VAWA 2013 improved public safety in your community if it has? Is my mic on? Yes, I can hear oh. you. Yes. Okay, good. And we can see you too. Hello, hello. Well, good hello, morning hello. to everyone in Alaska and on the West Coast. <laughs> well, it's I I guess it's unfortunate to say that a lot of the issues that uh, were brought forward in getting VAWA passed and by not including Alaska just left them out in the cold. They're just out there, but it was this it's the same issues up there. Um, as a result of Oliphant, <clears throat> you know, it created that jurisdictional question as to who has authority. And through time, I think some of the perpetrators have actually realized that, you know, I can go out there, I might be able to be arrested, but nobody's going to prosecute me. And, and it becomes a, um, a no man's territory, almost in Indian country prior to 2013. So, you know, to talk about a little bit about geographically, to understand the magnitude of uh, what the impacts have been, we need to understand also the situation that Tulalip was in. And so we're, we're a reservation of 22,000 acre, 22, acres north of Seattle, about 35 miles, right on the I-5 interstate. And then also intersecting the reservation, uh, we have a main county thoroughfare that runs through the reservation. So, with our economic development that's taken place up there and the residents that are on the reservation, we have over 100,000 people per day that come onto the reservation. Most of those being non-Indians coming onto the reservation. The population on the reservation is a little over 10,000 people. Um, I'm gonna say about 9,000 of that or 8,000 of that is non-Indian population on the reservation. 70% of all of our arrests by our tribal police department is for non-Indian on the reservation. And um, <clears throat> so prior to 2013, without having full jurisdiction or even partial jurisdiction as was authorized after 2013, 
there was a huge safety risk for all of the people, not just our tribal members, but all of the people living on the reservation, given that jurisdictional question. After 2013, when the bio provision passed, we, we got a step moving forward that gave us a process under certain conditions, there's always these caveats, under cer certain conditions that tribes could now prosecute for um, domestic crimes against native women on the reservation. And we've done that. As stated, Tulip was one of three pilot project tribes authorized in the VAWA 2013 legislation. And we prosecuted our first case in February of 2014. And through the end of 2021, uh, coming up here quickly, we will have prosecuted over 40 defendants that, that in the past would have gone unprosecuted. We could have uh, submitted our charges to the uh, county, to the state, or to the federal government, but oftentimes they were not picked up for whatever reason, either lack of attention, lack of resources, or maybe just even an unwillingness to. So with the tribe's ability to pick up and start prosecuting these cases, it has made a definite uh, uh, positive impact. Um, the perpetrators, as I stated, look for opportunity and they find that niche uh, oftentimes on, on our reservation. But from 2014 to 2019, we had 36 defendants. These defendants had a combined contact of over 171 times with our tribal law enforcement. Prior to being prosecuted under VAWA 2013, this, this, this statistic is staggering when you think about the amount of population that we're having to deal with. And this, these 36 requiring over 171 contacts through time um, shows the perpetual habit that they have of domestic violence. <clears throat> we all know that prosecuting people for criminal activities deter people from committing additional crimes. So why wouldn't they keep coming back to the reservation? They know, they know now that they can be prosecuted and they can face real penalties. I guess the, at, when you think about it all, it shows the cause or the damage of the jurisdictional question. When perpetrators find loopholes, find ways to take advantage of it, but then our victims, our victims have no legal recourse. Nobody stands up for them. Nobody, nobody seeks justice for them. And it's, it's dumbfounding to think that in the world that we live in today, that this would even be an issue. And even though we had gains here to leave Alaska out of it for the same dealing with the same issues at an even greater rate than anywhere else is dumbfounding. And we just need to continue to work to, to get these changes passed. And as Michelle brought out, you know, the most, the most trying time for a victim is when they choose to finally say, enough is enough, I need to leave. And there has to be resources available for them when they do that. Because if, if there's no prosecution or if there's no protection for the domestic crimes that come against them, they get worse. They, they magnify. And, and to think that uh, those people have to continue to live with that when they're finally fed up, it's again, a very disturbing thought to think of when you think about your own spouse or your own women in your family, your children, your grandchildren, to think what they're gonna to have to live with to without this type of protection. So overall, is Tulalip safer? Yes, but as you mentioned earlier, there are some glaring gaps that surface uh, through this process. I believe that uh, when the tribes start doing this themselves, they can do this better than anyone else taking this jurisdiction over but also providing a process to heal for our, those victims. 
We know our communities better than anyone else. We know our communities better than any outside law enforcement agency out there. Uh, and we can, in fact, is we even have personal knowledge of things that have happened through rumor, innuendo, or, or maybe even past practice. And so we know how to deal with that. We know where to look and we can re respond and act in a more timely manner than any outside agency. Our courts are ready and equipped to move forward, to get restraining orders in place in timely manners, to get prosecution done in timely manners. Because oftentimes in, a, in the outside court system, even if they do pick it up, and even if they go to press charges, it could be months, months on top of months before anything actually happens. And so as we continue to build our network, our system, it, it supports those victims to know that they can feel safer in coming forward. They have some protection, they have some process. process. Um, and so again, is our reservation safer? I have to say, absolutely. Are there still issues to deal with? Absolutely. Can we get the next stage of VAWA passed? I certainly hope so. And hopefully we can get it done in this session here. Thank you, Vice Chairman. And, you know, I just think that um, thanks to your leadership and the leadership to Lalip, I know your tribal nation has provided a great deal of expertise and guidance to all the other tribes who are seeking to implement VAWA's restored tribal criminal jurisdiction. I know you all have spent countless hours assisting other tribes uh, with advice and guidance. And I just think too, it's so critical to know that we have tribal leaders who will stand with our victim advocates and our survivors in, in telling Congress that uh, you know there is a connection between safety for native women and children and sovereignty, and that our tribal leaders are fighting right there with us to be able to protect us in our own homes. And I think that has been a, um, a really important thing when we go to meet with people on the Hill, that they understand that this, uh, this is a movement where tribal leaders are at the table demanding the restoration of tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty. So thank you so much for all of your advocacy. Uh, I know um, you are someone who, who will always, even at the last minute, get up at 6 a.m. on the West Coast to, 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 to talk with anyone on the Hill about VAWA. So I really, really appreciate all that you're doing. Um, all right, so we now have another clip that we are going to look at from Sliver of Full Moon. Uh, and so that's clip number two, Marlon. And then we will, after that, come back and ask a few more questions of our panelists. Thank you, everyone. There was a time. Before now, there was a time. Time. When we didn't have this kind of violence. Not like we do now. Our men knew to view women in sacred manner. Not to say that we lived in a perfect society. Because we didn't. But we certainly didn't live in a society where women are treated like this. It was never, it was like, never this. like this. They introduced it. When the soldiers came to round us up. To send us on the trail of tears. When they first put us on the reservation. When they forced us to go to their schools. We had to, we had to hide. We had to go to the fort. To get our food. To get our rations, our commodities from, from soldiers. And when we went to the fort to get our food. What's this? I've come for my rations. And we're all out. Please, sir, I have children. I said we're all out. I have to feed my children. Come in the back. Are you deaf? I said, come in the back. You know, you don't get something for nothing around here. You want to feed your children, you come in the back. My grandmother. My grandmother. Our grandmothers. Our grandmothers they, they were raped by the government agent. For food. To feed their children. Raped by the soldiers. Just because they could. They had to run. They had to hide. They had no choice. Our grandmother. My grandmother. They're survivors. Survivors, survivors of war. They weren't targeted because of the color of their skin. We aren't targeted. 
because of the color of our skin. We are targeted because of who we are as Indian women. As Native American women. Alaskan Native women. Because we're citizens of sovereign nations. Because we're sovereign women. It's been this way for 500 years. Since the Russians came. Since 1492. Since, Since 1978. 1998. We're still sovereign. I wish I could say the war has ended, but we live in conflict every day. It's time for change. Awful. It's the truth. I had no idea. Senator Brown, do you have a minute? This is coming from Crapo. I'm in a rush. Yes, from Crapo. He's read the bill. I'd like to talk to you about VAWA. Senator Heller wants you to know. The tribal jurisdiction provision. You have his vote. Thank you. Uh, you have my vote. Relay Crapo? Yes. Thank you. Senator Collins. Um, uh, do I know you? Dennis Whitehawk. I represent the Eastern Band of Cherokee. You and you want to talk to me about VAWA? Yes. yes. Well, I spoke to Patty. We have some questions. I liked her answers. The tribal jurisdiction provision is very important. You have my vote. Thank you. Senator McCain agrees. Great. You have his vote. Thank you. But he doesn't think you'll pass the House. Senator Snow. We'd like to discuss VAWA. Sure. Jurisdiction is critical. Without it. You have my vote. Thank you. And the vote of every Republican woman in the Senate. That's great. You look surprised. We just, I guess I didn't expect. You didn't think a bunch of Republicans would support you on this? Let me tell you something. We may be Republicans, but first and foremost, we're women. That's a lot of Republicans. I talked to Brown. I spoke to Snow. McCain staffer. And Heller. They said yes. We might have enough votes. Senator Moran wanted me to tell you. No. Senator Rubio, with all due respect. He can't vote for this. And you won't change my mind. Did he say why? You can't negotiate with Cornyn. You can't negotiate with him. Let me get this straight. Big government and inefficiency. The tribal jurisdiction provision restores jurisdiction at the local I'm level. I'm sorry. You're taking authority away from the state. I don't believe this. And giving it to the feds. That's not at all what we're doing. I read the bill. Senator Shelby wanted me to tell you. McCain's voting for it. I'm Senator Lee, not McCain. His vote is now. Does he understand? I'm late for a meeting. Senator Toomey. Uh, yes. I'd like to talk to you about VAWA. Oh. I have a meeting with Senator Wicker. Well, he's not here. The tribal jurisdiction provision is very important. I understand your position, but, uh... When will he be back? I've made up my mind. We said we would discuss VAWA. I discussed it with him. My vote is no. He's against it. Seriously? I'm sorry, I can't help you. We just don't agree here. Thank you for your time. Talk to Kim T. Where's the White House? Fully on board. That's great. Lay says they're voting this week. Do we have enough votes? I don't know. I'm worried we don't. Senator. Great, thank you so much, Marlon. So that's a another clip from Silver or Full Moon. And I think it's just important since we're in the exact same position we were eight years ago, we're having uh, um, some of the exact same conversations we had eight years ago to just remind ourselves what an uphill battle it was. And, and I think it's really important to note as the women who share their stories in this play would say, and it's true, that uh, our tribes are inherently sovereign, right? We have the inherent right to protect ourselves. That, you know, that didn't change until the Supreme Court's decision in Oliphant in 1978. So we're not asking Congress to give us something. We're asking Congress to restore what should have never been taken. And I think that's that's an important backdrop to all of these conversations. And it's interesting to watch 
uh, the depictions of the different actors playing different senators and different staffers, because some of those Republican senators who were staunchly opposed to tribal jurisdiction in 2013 have been way more open to it today, which is great, uh, because we're talking about the further, further restoration of tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians in this VAWA. And some have backtracked, quite frankly, and some who were very supportive of the restoration of tribal jurisdiction um, today maybe have some more doubts. And so um, I'm going to take this next question to Carrie Colfer from the NIWRC. And so, uh, Carrie, in the 2013 reauthorization of VAWA, many in the U.S. Senate and House called into question the legitimacy of tribal courts and asked whether tribes could fairly adjudicate the rights of non-Indians. What is your response to someone who questions the legitimacy of tribal courts? And do you think that's happening right now as we try to get VAWA passed in the Senate? Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, I mean, I think it's extremely important to make sure the rights of defendants, including non-Indian defendants, are being protected, which is absolutely the case in tribal courts who exercise special jurisdiction pursuant to VAWA 2013. And that's because VAWA 2013 requires any tribe exercising special domestic violence criminal jurisdiction must provide due process um, protections to defendants. So those tribes have to protect, um, must provide all the protections listed in the Indian Civil Rights Act. The defendant must have the right to trial by an impartial jury, um, which is drawn from a pool that reflects the community, um, including non-Indians, and the tribe must provide all rights necessary under the Constitution. And tribal courts have proven that they're legitimate and capable of protecting the rights of non-Indians over the last seven, eight years. Um, and so we can see that in the case statistics from VAWA Im implementing tribes, which show that tribal justice systems are similar to any other criminal justice systems in the country and functioning the way they should be. Um, Im implementing tribes have invested a lot of time and money into their judicial systems, which you've heard from um, Vice Chair, uh, Chairman Gobin, um, to ensure that they're consistent with the requirements laid out in VAWA 2013, because this is one of their big priorities. They wanna make sure that they're doing everything they can to improve safety in their communities. Um, and so, yes, we're, de we're definitely seeing that tribes are pre protecting the rights of um, non-Indian defendants, and we are still hearing that they don't, um, but there haven't really been any cases where we're not seeing uh, defendants protected. And so um, we just have to keep pointing to the statistics of all the cases that we've seen over the last seven, eight years um, in response to that. And uh, yeah, there's really nothing to show otherwise. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, as you can see in the, I think that it was already dropped in the chat before the NCAI five-year report. Um, you can see all of those statistics if you want to go back and look um, from the first five uh, years uh, for VAWA implementing tribes. Thanks, MK. And it feels a little bit like deja vu, some of the conversations we're having. Um, <laughs> we're, you know, uh, we're having some of the same conversations we had in 2013. And I think what's frustrating you know, for folks like Vice Chairman Glenn Gobin, Michelle, Kerry, me, who are having these conversations on the Hill, is that we've spent the last eight years implementing VAWA 2013 and protecting the rights of non-Indian defendants. And instead of talking about, instead of being able to talk to some of the offices on the Hill about why we need additional categories of criminal jurisdiction restored or the crisis in Alaska, they're focused on the rights of non-Indian defendants when no one has a shred of ev evidence that their rights have been violated, right? I mean, obviously, if there was a serious problem, we would want to talk about it. We're, we're people who are, you know, want everyone to have the right to justice and due process, but that's not being denied here. And it was, it's a tiny handful of senators, tiny, tiny, tiny handful, but they're very loud. And um, we're having to, I think, respond to the same criticisms that were given in 2013 that I think quite frankly are just baseless and they're not they're not based on actual evidence of deprivation of any kind of rights they're just meant to distract from the real goal here which is restoring tribal jurisdiction and sovereignty and so I would thank Carrie for all of her advocacy I know she's in the thick of it I know she has a million meetings a day on VAWA right now it is happening in real time um, so I want to next uh, jump back to Michelle and, and just ask her about this current VAWA reauthorization that we're talking about right now. I know she's been very involved in advocating and folks are advocating for an Alaska pilot project. And what would this Alaska pilot project look like and why is it so important that we reauthorize VAWA in this moment with an Alaska pilot project this time around? 
Thank you for the question, Mary Catherine. And um, again, to be able to set the context for this, I need to provide statistics. Um, it's really important that people understand the issues that we're faced in Alaska. As Vice Chairman Gobin stated, perpetrators look for opportunities to commit their violence. They understand that they may not be charged with any crime or be held accountable in Indian country. Perpetrators in Alaska know this, and it is no wonder our MMIW rates um, are the highest among the nation. Um, so just even from 2004 to 2007, there were two and a half times more likely uh, to die by homicide, Alaska Natives that is, um, than those who uh, identify as white. Um, and then as for the murder epidemic, the Violence Policy Center in 2019 stated that Alaska is ranked first among states with the highest homicide rate of women by men, and it is the most violent state with Anchorage as one of the most violent cities within the union. And um, when they didn't provide a breakdown of the statistics of Native American women as compared to other races, but it was it topped out at about 40% of those individuals were um, American Indian or Alaska Native. Um, and so it's no wonder that, um, you know, we're just seeing this war on Native American women in Alaska and, and very little is happening. As far as missing persons go, and of course not all missing person cases are violence, but a lot of them are uh, as a result of that. Um, as of August 2021, there were 734 missing Alaska Native American Indians with 292 um, in Alaska alone. So out of the nation of 734 missing um, American Indian and Alaska Native individuals, 292 were from Alaska, and we're one of the least populated states in the union. So we really need to have some sort of centralized law enforcement within our communities. Um, we cannot count on Alaska or the federal government to do anything be based on what they have done in the past, right? Isn't that the, the definition of insanity? To do the same thing and expect a different result? But, um, you know, in Alaska, in our communities, we need to have the same recognition of our inherent sovereignty to govern our communities. We need to be able to provide safe communities, but we also need to provide healing. So many of our native men um, and, and some of the non-native men um, who are committing the violence are part of our communities and they need assistance. And so, um, across the board, we're just not getting services for victims, perpetrators, and we're getting no justice. And so a pilot project would just be vital to reversing that trend. Um, and, and it's really more than a trend. So that's really an inaccurate description. Um, so as I mentioned, um, again, and I'm sorry to, to really beat on this, but with the lack of law enforcement, um, who are the first responders or tribal leaders? Um, our women, um, our children. And oftentimes, um, you know, we have murder scenes where people are having to try to preserve evidence. Well, first of all, let me say that when there's a, a violent crime, um, we're not really thinking about the crime, we're thinking about the injury to the individual. And so we're going in and we're, you know, maybe without medics, maybe without any sort of health care, and, and we're just trying to save all life, right? And then uh, we discover that the life um, is gone. And so what happens? Then we get into the mode of trying to preserve evidence. Um, and so, but the evidence is probably already contaminated. But then add the fact that it may take hours, days, weeks for law enforcement to come in and actually investigate the crime. How do you maintain the crime scene for that long? How, I mean, can you imagine, and, and I have to just leave this point, can you imagine having um, someone, a loved one's body out in the cold, um, subject to ailments, to animals, um, and having to wait for hours yet days in order to move that individual. I mean, it's inhumane. And so these are the types of situations that, that people just don't understand that we're encountering in Alaska. And it's something that we really have to educate. And I, I just appreciate your advocacy, Mary Catherine, in um, Sliver of the Full Moon. It's just a brilliant play that really captures the issues. But um, as to your question about what will a pilot uh, project look like in Alaska? Well, um, 
first of all, the intertribal working group that was part of the 2013 uh, pilot project was just a wonderful creation of bringing together a mind trust, technical assistance, um, and in helping tribes come together and provide the resources that smaller tribes may not have the ability to do. So we're hoping for an intertribal working group that would have strong technical assistance and experts in various areas to help navigate, um, you know, political issues. Um, in terms of, you know, the ultimate cure would be to have um, Indian country proclaimed in Alaska. But the state of Alaska seems to be really against that issue. And so um, they've defined um, the House bill, um, defines uh, Indian country and, and captures it in a certain way um, that's easy, but um, easier than what the Senate bill. The Senate bill is using a, uh, well, we haven't seen a Senate bill, have we? But the Senate bill from last session um, had um, Alaska jurisdiction as part of a census area. And, um, and so, you know, that's going to be a challenge, um, but um, one that we're, we will rise to. And it's, you know, just like BOWA 2013, it's not just any random person that will be prosecuted. You know, these communities have to be, um, make up like 75% Native American. These are um, you know, communities that um, have really maintained their cultural uh, identity and, um, but yet lack that, um, that those resources to really protect their community. And so, um, so a pilot project in Alaska, well, it will be based on justice, but it will also be based on community accountability and um, justice and community accountability might look a little bit different in Alaska because we are remote, we are different, um, but it will be a little bit different in positive manners in that, you know, we'll, we'll be working on rehabilitation, healing, and, um, and, you know, the bottom line is providing um, resources to our women who are um, victims. So um, I really thank you for the question. And I'm really sorry to go off on um, all of our statistics, but they're just so poor. And if you don't, if I don't share them, how will you know about it? Goodness, Chish. Well, I really appreciate that, Michelle. And I think that um, I know a lot of us are really hopeful about the Alaska Pilot Project and um, very much believe in, you know, believe in the Alaska Pilot Project. And I know there's some language maybe to be worked out, but I think it looks very hopeful that it will be included in this next VAWA. And I know all of us, uh, including NIWRC, TLPI, others are, you know, no VAWA without the Alaska Pilot Project. So it's, um, it's great to see this coming together. And um, I just appreciate you and your advocacy uh, and being, being willing here, being willing to be here and talk about it. So we're gonna jump into the final clip from Sliver of Full Moon. And then I'll have just a few more questions for our panelists and then we will open it up to the Q&A. So uh, Marlon, looks like you have it ready to go. Thank you so much. Who's got the press? I'm with the Washington Post. The uh, Los Angeles Times. You have a minute? Yes. yes. I read Diane Milch's story. It's powerful. I'd like to hear yours. Why are you here? Speak out. To share my story. To stop the That's silence. Fun. Why are you advocating for jurisdiction? One out of three Native women will be raped in her lifetime. 60% of Native women will be assaulted in their lifetime. Alaska Native women experience the highest rates of violence in the United States. Our women, our children, were are not safe. What happened? My husband tried to shoot me. He threatened to drown me. Said he would kill me. My coworker took a bullet in his shoulder. Unbelievable. The majority of violent crimes committed against Native women are committed by a non-Native. They come to our reservations because they know they can abuse our women. They know they're safe. They're protected by the law, by the Supreme Court's decision in Benitai. Did you call, Did you the, call the police? Doesn't help. They can't do anything. They don't have jurisdiction. On your reservation? According to the Supreme Court, because I am a native woman living on my tribe's lands. Because we have no Indian country. The law won't protect me. What kind of message does that send to our women? I know what message it sent to me. 
I don't understand. If the violence is so bad. If you aren't safe on your reservation. If he lives in your home and... Your home is dangerous. Why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? Wouldn't the laws of the state protect you if you leave your reservation? My great, great, great grandfather was Wyagadoga or Standing Wolf. During the time of the removal, the soldiers came to take him and his family to force them to walk the Trail of Tears. At that time, a white man named George Hayes was living with the Cherokee people. My grandfather asked Hayes what he could do to avoid going west and be allowed to remain in his homeland. Hayes advised him to save up all of his food rations and when he saw the opportunity to break away and make his way back home, but not to be caught because that could mean severe punishment or death. One day, several weeks later, Hayes was out working in his yard and he saw a small group of people approaching on the horizon. It was Standing Wolf, his wife, and she held a small newborn baby. Standing Wolf told George Hayes that his new son was named Wyatt Uchanti, or Comeback Wolf, because that was their only wish to come back home. This is the story of why I and my grandmothers and grandfathers before me came to be here in these mountains in Western North Carolina. The Cherokee elders say that we have always been here. We will always be here. It's believed that we were given our home here in these mountains by Creator. And since it was Creator who gave it to us, only He can take it from us. So did I ever think of leaving Cherokee? No, not once, ever. This is my, my home. And I'll never leave my home. Thank you, Marlon. And um, uh, it's unfortunate that Billy Joe can't be here with us today because those are her words and that's her story from her family and her nation. But I think she echoes what so many of us um, feel who work on these issues that it is it is just crazy right that that our women and children our two spirit relatives our men our people cannot aren't safe in their own homes you know you would never think to tell the state of Kansas I'm sorry Kansas you do not have criminal jurisdiction over anyone who comes into Kansas if they're not a citizen of Kansas if they're a citizen of Colorado they can rape or kill your citizens and you don't get to prosecute them. That would be absurd, but that is exactly what our tribal governments have been told. And that means that for native women or children or any native person uh, who, is a, who is a victim of this kind of abuse, that their choice is often leave my home to be safe or stay and continue to not be safe and possibly risk my life or the life of my children or my family or my loved ones. And so it's, um, it's an insane injustice. And so I wanna turn it over to Vice Chairman Gobin again, and I sort of have two questions combined here, but one is just as a tribal leader, what is that connection between sovereignty and safety for native women and children that you see? And also talking about VAWA 2013 only restored tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian perpetrated crimes of domestic violence, dating violence and violation of protection orders. Advocates are saying now that in the current VAWA reauthorization, gaps remain, um, you know, child abuse, elder abuse, sexual assault, trafficking, uh, assault on our tribal law enforcement. So uh, to Vice Chairman Gobin, what gaps have you seen specifically and how have they undermined public safety in your community on your Tulalip reservation? Thank you so much. Oh, you're muted, Vice Chairman. Let me first say that this is very frustrating to still be talking about all of this with all of the facts and figures and reality that we have put out there since pre-passing of VAWA. And to think that we're still here today trying to advocate for protection of our Native women, but also other domestic partners. It could be boys, it could be men. It's about violence, that domestic violence that happened. To think that we're still here talking about that is just dumbfounding. Because if you took the race factor or you took the Indian name away and it was anybody else, there'd be laws already in place. 
But the fact that these are native women and we're dealing with them, that they seem to have lesser value. The comment that says, first and foremost, we are women. Because you are native women does not make you less than a woman. And you deserve the same protection as everyone else. And the fact that Oliphant basically stripped a key factor of our judicial, our government system of which all governments are built on, and that's that judicial component. We are left wide open with the inability to protect our women, that domestic violence. And it, it needs to be restored if we're gonna truly be exercise the sovereignty that we've always had to restore that, to protect our community members, our women, our membership. And um, so what has this done to build that? It's a step in the right direction. If we pass the new VAWA with the expanded language in there, it's another step in the right direction, but it's not full. You know, to think that because you don't have a sufficient enough relationship with the, the victim, and then you can't prosecute. Well, as, as somebody was bringing out, we know that in most cases of domestic violence, oftentimes there are children in the home, whether that because of how we live, they could be the own their own children, they could be nieces or nephews in the home staying because of the multi-generational homes that we may have. And to have domestic violence take place and when the perpetrator steps away or uh, leaves the room and the the victim is left laying there, the children are those first responders in probably almost all incidents of they're there. They're going there to provide care and ultimately put themselves on the line to become victims as well. And, and we have no way to even protect them when that happens because there isn't that relationship tie that's there. We didn't have that expanded jurisdiction to cover them. We've had eight cases that we filed where children were involved and we turn them into the feds. Only one of those has ever been prosecuted. One out of eight. And the children are left with, with no hope. And even in that process, when, when you're doing your investigation, are the, the other first responders, the ones with the badge on or the medics that show up, they can be assaulted. We have no way to prosecute against those crimes. When the firemen are there, the policemen are there, they can be assaulted. We have no way to prosecute those crimes. And if there are drugs involved or other, other illegal substances or things that are found, you have no way to deal with those. You can turn those over to the feds, but if they choose to just sit on it, nothing happens. And those are key factors in any other outside domestic violence case where they would be additional charges that would go against the perpetrator to give them more time, uh, punishment for their crime. But even when we do prosecute, when we have them, we're limited in the amount of time that we can sentence. We're capped at three years that we can sentence for some of these crimes. That's, that's another issue that's, that's out there. And so we have a lot of work to do for something that is so obvious. And somehow we have to put this back on the people that we're trying to convince. Um, because you know, as well as I do, that we've dealt with those comments exactly that are in your play, sitting in these rooms, talking with these senators or these congressmen. And it's not their uh, willingness that's holding them back. It's their ignorance that is holding them back because, um, they choose to get lost in an old world mentality without realizing what's taking place. You can watch the news today and be all upset about how the women are being treated in foreign countries. And the United States will step up to provide aid or, pro or the world organizations will step up to provide aid to find some protections for these women. But at home in Indian country, that's not the case. We have to fight and bring attention to these issues Every time we're there, whether we're on a VAWA subject or something different, there's always at the end of the meeting, we encourage you to look at VAWA and pass the reauthorization. And, and so it has to be a continued message that we bring forward. 
and bring it forward in a way that touches the values of the people that we're talking about. Put the case on their wives, their children, their sister, their mom. I, I am a grandson from my grandmother. I know my mother. I have daughters. I have granddaughters. I want them protected always. I want them to feel that they have a place here, that they can get justice, that they can be served. And um, so I don't know where I'm going to end that, but we got a lot of work to do uh, to get this done again in a subject that should just be so obvious, that should just be passed and get this done for everybody. I just, I so appreciate that, Vice Chairman. And I know Tulalip has been a huge advocate, especially when it comes to the child abuse issue, because like you said, it is an insane injustice that a tribal law officer can show up and protect the mother or the father, whoever the victim is, and not the children. Um, and, and, you know, there's so many, I mean, we need a full Oliphant fix, right? I mean, Oliphant is just a problem. <laughs> Um, it remains, as Jerry Gardner says, the oliphant in the room. Um, but until, and I, Jerry, I will always give you credit because that is a brilliant quote and I will never steal the credit for that brilliant quote. But, um, you know, we have to advocate, we have to advocate for a full oliphant fix. But there, in the meantime, uh, there is just no excuse to tell tribes that their children, native children, don't deserve the same protections as non native children. I mean, it is. It, it's just inexplicable how anyone could possibly agree with that. So, um, so that is that brings me to my next question for Carrie. And we are here. We are, you know, fighting for VAWA 2021. Um, and the NIWRC has been absolutely instrumental in advocating for VAWA reauthorization, both in 2013 and now. VAWA expired in 2018. It is now 2021, and it is yet to be reauthorized. Why is it so critical that we get VAWA passed now? And what can individuals who are tuning in today do if they want to help get VAWA passed? Is there can they make a phone call? Can they write a letter? What should they, is there anything people can do if they want to get involved and help advocate? Thanks, Mary Catherine. Um, I mean, it's critical that we get VAWA passed now because Native people continue to experience violence at disproportionate rates with very little access to justice and support, in large part because, as Vice Chairman Govan said, tribes don't have jurisdiction over non-Native perpetrators of sexual violence and crimes that co-occur with domestic violence, like child abuse and stalking. And th this violence doesn't just pause or take a break while we wait for the bill to pass. Um, so, you know, this VAWA bill that um, the House passed in March expands jurisdiction over these crimes to help bring justice to more victims in Indian country. But the longer we wait to pass this bill in the Senate and get it to the president's desk, the more victims we see go without help. Um, and so what can people, can people do to help reauthorize the bill? They can contact their senators, let them know as constituents that they want their senators to make VAWA a priority and to pass it with tribal provisions like those in the House bill. Um, now I know not everyone is always comfortable making a call or they don't feel like they have the time. So um, there's a link in the chat um, to a pre-written VAWA letter that based on your address will just be sent directly to your specific two senators asking them to pass VAWA with those provisions that are in the House bill. And also please feel free to use that pre-written letter as a script or talking points if you do decide to call your senators offices and set up a meeting or leave a voicemail. Um, and also please tweet your, uh, at your senators Use hash, the hashtags VAWA for all and VAWA 21, and we can also put that in the chat. Um, it's important that we make it publicly known that we can't wait any longer for the Senate to pass this bill and to let them know all the good that this bill will do to protect Native communities. I think this bill gets really tied up a lot in politics, and, it, and it's, you know, often you like many scare tactics are used, but we need to talk about how good this bill is for protecting native people and native communities. Um, and I know you've heard several people on the panel express frustration that we're still talking about this, um, that we still have to keep convincing people and convincing members of Congress that our lives mean something that we're deserving of justice. So I know you've heard these same things about trying to convince the Senate to pass the bill um, over and over, but I promise you that your voice is very important to this effort. Um, and so if you have any questions about how to, 
to get involved, how to reach out, how to send that letter, just feel free to, you can let me know in the chat and I'd be happy to, um, to help with uh, take action. So any, any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, thanks, MK. Thank you, Carrie. Such, such an, an um, amazing point. And I just want to note too, I think a lot of times people will say, well, uh, both of my, my senators are Democrats, so I shouldn't, I mean, we know they're on board, no, no need to call them. And I, that is not the case because we're at this weird crossroads where even some of our allies right now are saying, wait a second, uh, we know that not everyone's on board with the tribal provision or the Alaska pilot project. So maybe we just need a straight reauth a straight reauthorization of the tribal provision, and we'll work on edits to the other parts of our that aren't so controversial. And it's, it's, that's a problem. So we got to stop that. And so we need all the Democrats to have very clear commitments to either, either we're doing the House version of the bill, HR 1620, or we're not doing anything at all because we have got to get those edits, those amendments to the tribal provision that include Alaska, that include Maine, the tribes in Maine that, you know, restore tribal criminal jurisdiction over non-Indian child abuse. So, you know, NIWC has done the really heavy lift of crafting all that language. You really can just use it and copy and paste it or use it as a script. But I just wanted to follow up to Carrie's point that, like, don't assume that just because your senators might be Democrats that they're fully on board. Unfortunately, we can't afford that assumption. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Carrie. Yeah, and I did want to add that there is a big difference between your senators technically supporting VAWA and the tribal provisions we want and them making it a priority because they can support it all they want, but if they don't put it first on their list, it's not gonna happen. And so that's what we need from our supporters in the Senate is for them to actually prioritize this bill and to understand, like Michelle said, it means life or death for women in native communities. And so uh, that's really, you know, even if you hear from, you know, if you're in California and you hear from your senators, you know, like, we, of course we support it. It's Feinstein was the one who wrote the bill. Still let them know that you, that tribes want this and they want it now um, and that it needs to be, you know, put on the floor. It needs to be introduced. So um, it's still very, very important. No matter where you are, your voice definitely still matters. That's so true. And the other thing too, you know, we're having conversations with some of the this, some of the Republican senators who voted against it in 2013, and they're more open to it now. So, you know, also don't discount uh, if you're somewhere where your senator voted against it in 2013, have those conversations, advocate, because, you know, people are shifting in their positions. And I think we can always educate people, right? We can always, so I I, I, I don't even want to give up on Senator Cornyn, you know, we just got to find the right way to reach him and to talk to him and, uh, and set him down and explain to him because obviously that hasn't happened yet. And, you know, we just, he just needs to be educated as another Jerry Gardner quote, he, he, uh, he suffers the burden of lack of education or however, however Jerry um, says it. Actually, Jerry has informed me that I need to give credit to John Hart for the Oliphant in the room uh, quote. So Mr. John Hart, thank you so much. And Jerry, I appreciate your, willing to, your willingness to, to share the credit there for that, for that quote. Um, I do wanna jump to Michelle for another question. And I know Michelle, earlier you were mentioning some of the outrageous statistics when it comes to murdered and missing indigenous persons and relatives in Alaska. You know, oftentimes I will always say to people, you, you want, people will say, oh my gosh, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls is such a crisis, but where do we even begin? And I say VAWA. VAWA will, will reduce the number of native people who are murdered. And I think a lot of times people forget that that connection, that domestic violence and sexual assault are crimes that usually escalate in nature in the context of intimate relationships and families. And that if you if there isn't that intervention, if there is, aren't criminal consequences for this kind of illegal behavior, it does escalate to homicide. And so but how, how will uh, reauthorizing the Violence Against Women Act with an Alaska pilot project assist you and other advocates in Alaska in combating the crisis of murdered and missing indigenous women and girls in Alaska? Well, that is that all related in your eyes? It absolutely is. Uh, again, thank you for the question. Right now, very few cases are being prosecuted or it'll take years for a case to be prosecuted, um, whether it's rape, sexual assault, um, uh, murder. Um, we have a backlog of rape kits, for example, um, and um, we had a rape case from 2013 in a very small community, and just this year they identified the perpetrator because of the backlog of rape rape kits. And so that community was living in terror for eight years, not knowing who it was that was responsible for this um, rape of a young woman. Um, 
so you know, and I, and I hate, hate this because I feel like I have to overshare, but you know, um, where do people, where do women go to escape the violence? Um, you know, when we're seeing less and less reporting of crimes because nothing's happening. So what do we do? We just deal with it. How do we deal with it? Um, we turn to drugs, we turn to alcohol, anything that's numbing the pain. Um, I know that's what I did. I'm a survivor of child, uh, family violence, sexual assault. And, um, and for, you know, 33 years ago, I was still using actively using alcohol and drugs. Um, but this year, this month, I'll have 34 years. Um, but that was a way to deal with the pain. And, and that's what our women do. But as a result of that, then we get put on trial. Um, we're um, seen as lesser, we're seen as, um, as not deserving of, um, of the prosecution, um, we're minimized. So, um, so, you know, so it's just really painful. Um, our women are also being targeted um, for human trafficking. We are desirable because we are considered exotic. We can pass for a number of nationalities. Um, and so we can fit whatever uh, degenerate, view um, that person is looking for. Um, and so many of our victims of trafficking fall prey to the MMIW crisis. Many of our um, women of um, sexual assault and um, violence escape the home to end up homeless and fall victim to the MMIW crisis. How is it appropriate for our tribal leaders and children to be the first responders um, of violence. It's just not, it's just not. And so, um, you know, so much harm is done when our cases are finally prosecuted and then our victims are put on trial. Um, and so it's, it's such a numbing effect. Um, overall. And so, and so that's where the pilot project really can help um, empower our women to realize that, um, you know, it's not okay to commit violence against us, that our lives matter. Um, you know, I, I always hate to, you know, <laughs> to have the parade of horribles, as they call it, of course, but, um, you know, without, but you need to know the stark reality of what we face. But also, you know, I, I think it's really important to realize that we have beautifully rich communities where our native languages are still spoken, our tribal values are still exercised, we still live on subsistence. We have wonderful, beautiful communities. And it's just, it's because we, we do have such uh, tribal values that we're just minimized um, because we don't we don't find it culturally appropriate to raise our voices. We don't find it culturally appropriate to challenge people, um, you know. Um, so, so in any event, um, because of this violence, our MMIW rates are just through the roof, as I shared, and um, and our women, it's going to get worse before it gets better. If and especially if VAWA doesn't pass this year, um, I'm just really. I'm so concerned about the safety of our communities because um, we're just getting the message again and again that our lives don't matter. And, um, and that's just not right. So thank you, Mary Catherine. Really appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, all right, I have one more question and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And this is a quick question to carry because I think it, a, an important component of this VAWA reauthorization that we're looking to secure is actually an increase in funding for tribal governments. And you know that's something that NIWRC has been advocating for. And Carrie, why, why are we advocating for an increase in funding to tribal governments in this VAWA reauthorization? Why is that so critical? Well, it's, it's critical, um, this additional funding is really critical to ensure that tribes not only have the authority to prosecute perpetrators of violence, but also the necessary resources and those things go hand in hand in enabling tribes to better protect their communities and protect the rights of both victims and perpetrators. And so we're, we're looking for, um, you know, a reimbursement program um, that will uh, reimburse tribes for costs incurred while exercising special tribal criminal jurisdiction, which includes many things like um, 
uh, detaining inmates, including providing health care for inmates, expenses related to indigent um, defense services, uh, as well as um, probation and rehabilitation services. So it's really important that tribes have everything they need to successfully exercise special tribal criminal jurisdiction under VAWA. And that includes being able to fund it properly, as well as giving tribes the authority or restoring the authority to tribes to actually exercise jurisdiction over non-Native perpetrators of violence and to fill in those gaps that we've seen from VAWA 2013, however successful it's been um, thus far. Thanks, MK. I like to also point out that, you know, the federal government has a trust duty and responsibility to fund tribal governments. And, you know, they have a trust duty and responsibility to fund tribal justice systems. Uh, the federal government funds state systems, funds a lot of county law enforcement, and those counties didn't sign treaties with the United States to give the United States all the land that constitutes the United States today in exchange for a promise to continue to fund tribal governments. So um, I just think that this is a trust duty and responsibility the federal government has, and we they need to step up and they need to fund our tribal courts. And as Vice Chairman Goldman can, can attest to, undertaking uh, VAWA restoration is a very heavy lift. It requires not just a lot of time and effort, but a lot of resources financially. And this shouldn't just be an option for the tribes that have those resources. And this should be an option for every tribe. Um, so I just wanna open it up to, um, to folks um, for questions. Are there any, and I don't know, uh, Jerry or Heather, if you guys, are there any specific questions? Oh, Vice Chairman Govin has his hand raised. So uh, do you want to start us off, Vice Chairman? Yeah, I just, you know, kind of just want to make some like closing end comments. Because one of the things that come up in this next reauthorization was the rights of the perpetrators. Came a very hot subject. And just to point out, the rights of the perpetrators cannot trump the rights of the victims. And so we need to keep that focus there. Status quo is unacceptable, totally unacceptable. And 2013 authorization for VAWA as a pilot project was for what reason? To test the waters, basically. And there is nothing that has come out of that these test projects that says uh, this limited jurisdiction has not worked. In fact, it's the opposite. <clears throat> it has worked. It has pro provided protections and warrants expansion of that. And I just wanted to point that out because there's nothing in our history of implementing this that brings out anything negative, only positive. I, I so appreciate that because I think we immediately go on the defensive and start defending our tribal courts and our tribal governments and the legitimacy of ourselves <laughs> and our nations. Um, and really, you know, we don't even question the premise, right, of the whole conversation. It's like, we're the population that's most likely to be abused, murdered, raped, assaulted. And, and your first thought is, how do we protect the abusers? Right. And, and again, we're not saying that we don't think people deserve due process. In fact, we provide that in our courts, but it's like the whole conversation is so problematic because um, for your for your for everything you just said, Vice Chairman, I, I so appreciate that. Um, all right. So I want to make sure, Jerry, I see you here now. Do we have any questions that we need to respond to at this time? Doesn't look like we we have any at, at the moment. There there had been a question about we cannot assume that anyone in government has the back of native peoples. They must all be educated whenever possible. Um, that was an, er, an earlier um, in, in entry in the Q and A. Agreed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Um, okay. Well. So it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. I know there's some great comments in the chat. Um, and so feel free to add a question, but I don't know, you know, we have about nine minutes left. And so, um, Michelle, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, and then and I, I will give Carrie a chance to give closing thoughts as well. Sure. Thank you. And thank you, Chairman, Vice Chairman Gobin. Um, your comments are so on point as usual, uh, but I think it is really important to note that um, at the time that VAWA 2013 
uh, was enacted, I was a reservation attorney for the Tulalip tribes, and we put together a fact sheet. And uh, you know, all of the almost all of the provisions that were required in VAWA, we had been doing since we um, created the tribal court in its current format. Um, and um, the brilliant Chief Judge Polly um, would often say, you know, when people would ask her about um, how VAWA is going, and um, you know. About, about the special rights of um, the defendants, um, Judge Polly would brush that aside and she would say, um, you know, this is business as usual. This is, um, you know, this is what we do. We provide due process. And, um, and that's absolutely right. So, um, so I, I just wanna say that, you know, Alaska deserves the recognition of its inherent sovereignty. Um, it's not a grant of jurisdiction, it's a recognition of jurisdiction, um, you know, which is quite a difference. And, um, and we need to be provided the resources. And as Chair, Vice Chairman Gobin said again, um, if it were any other nationality, um, people would be up in arms and, um, and it wouldn't be allowed, but because you know, our population numbers are so low uh, and we have such a, they think we have a small voice. Um, you know, we, our rights just are something that can be put aside for another day. Well, that's not true. We need to address this today. We need to address it this session. We cannot wait any longer for a fix to VAWA. So uh, again, I just wanna thank TLPI for the opportunity to share these um, comments today and uh, goodness cheesh. Thank you, Michelle. And um, Carrie, any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, just to reiterate, I, you know, VAWA 2013, um, tribes have been implementing VAWA 2013 since 2013. So we know, you know, we know what works, we know it's been successful, and we know what more needs to be done and who's falling through the gaps and who was left out. And so we're not reinventing the wheel with this new bill. We're just ensuring the people who were left out before are better protected. And so it's not something controversial. It's not some huge undertaking that's different than tribal courts have handled before. Um, and so, you know, I just want to state that it's, we're just asking for Alaskans and you know, Maine and victims of child abuse and sexual violence to be included in the bill. But VAWA 2013 already passed. We already saw restored jurisdiction and it worked and was successful and it made our communities better. And so, you know, I look forward to, you know, working with everyone to get this next installment of VAWA passed. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie. And, you know, as you can see, um, there's a lot actually that people can do on your own to support the VAWA reauthorization. Um, oh, we have a question. Um, do you see VAWA and the, re and the establishment of a special jurisdiction in certain cases as the first step towards overturning PL 280? Could you also talk about PL 280 and any conflicts and pushing back on it? Wow, that is a, a big question for five minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, does anyone, I, I, Michelle, Alaska is a PL280 state. Do you want to take that question for, I, I know five minutes isn't probably long enough to talk about all of uh, PL280, but if you have thoughts, um, would you well, like to res respond to that? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's definitely a larger conversation, especially for Alaska because of the lack of Indian country and the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. But Public Law 280 um, has, had a devastating impact on um, the six mandatory uh, states uh, for the tribes that are located within them. And, and definitely we need to start fixing um, PL 280. And we've seen the state of Washington do that with um, state legislation that um, allowed, uh, that provided for retrocession of, um, of, a, of jurisdiction. And, um, and so Washington, state often leads the way among other states in the nation. And it would be a, a good opportunity to revisit that because um, PL-280 is an unfunded mandate, right? Um, it uh, transferred the jurisdiction that the federal government had um, to the six states. And, um, and you know, 
that was completely unfair. It should have been, you know, we do have concurrent jurisdiction, but PL 280 states don't get, uh, the tribes within them do not get the same resources from the BIA for tribal courts and law enforcement. So it's a really complicated issue. It's tied to resources, funding, um, and, and probably increased violence in those, in those communities. So um, let's have that conversation. Agreed. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And we just have a couple minutes left here. Um, Jerry, I'm going to turn it over to you to do our closing, but I just want to thank TLPI for creating the space for this conversation. Happy 25th anniversary. Uh, TLPI does such significant work to support tribal sovereignty and the restoration of tribal jurisdiction. You do a lot for not just VAWA, but other issues and supporting tribal courts. And just really thank you for all the work that you all do at TLPI and for just giving us this platform today to advocate. Uh, thank you so, so much and happy, happy 25th. Thank, thank you so much, Mary Catherine. Thank, and thanks to the, our incredible panel. Um, and, and thank you for everyone for joining today's webinar on celebrating our journey. Um, as, as mentioned, the recordings and PowerPoints will be posted on hometlpi.org uh, backslash anniversary, or you can just click on the homepage of, of Home TLPI. Um, please, if you haven't already, uh, please uh, uh, consider registering for the remaining webinars in this 25th anniversary series. So there's uh, two more webinars coming up honoring our relatives on November 9th um, and uh, building, uh, building a vision for the future on November 16th. Um, and, and as mentioned, I think before is that there's a link um, uh, provided both uh, here, uh, you know, in, in, on the PowerPoints uh, and also in the announcements about the, the, this webinar, um, for a link to the presentation of the full sliver of a full moon uh, play from uh, the ABA presentation last November. Um, there's also information here, um, Marlon, if you go, go to the next slide, um, there's information on uh, other uh, another event this uh, coming up this month, which is the uh, November 9th, or November 12th, uh, there's a presentation of another of Mary Catherine's great plays. Uh, this time would be fairly traceable, um, and that's being presented um, by um, our co-sponsor, the uh, American Bar Association's Civil Rights and Social Justice Section. Um, and there's information here on registering for, for that one. Um, and finally, I'd like to again thank our thank Mary Catherine and our great uh, uh, panel. I'd like to also thank. You know, TLPI's great staff, TLPI's extraordinary board of directors, um, and uh, on the slide here is uh, the list of the committee members uh, in TLPI who've been working many months now in putting together all the different uh, activities for the 25th anniversary. And so thank you very much and, um, and look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vice Chairman Gobin. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Michelle.